you through a little bit about psoriatic arthritis for those who don't uh, don't know so much about it and then talk through the PSP which very much followed on from the psoriasis association one so I was lucky enough to sneak into the final workshop for that um, and because we were talking about planning one in psoriatic arthritis uh, and it was such a great experience that we went forward to run one um, following on really from the psoriasis one. So psoriatic arthritis probably affects about a third of people with psoriasis who will get a related arthritis. And there's a big variability in how bad that is. Um, so if you look really hard in clinics, you probably find, find about 30%. Um, if you don't look particularly hard in a lot of the studies, it's more like 15 to 20%. So there's a smaller proportion who have enough disease that they present to clinic and need treatment. And there's a lot of people who have very mild aches and pains uh, that they manage and actually never see their doctor about. And for the vast majority of patients, they get the psoriasis before they get the arthritis. Um, so we very much, uh, we look at things from a different perspective as rheumatologists and dermatologists. Dermatologists talk about psoriatic arthritis being a comorbidity, a related condition to psoriasis. We think of psoriasis as pre-disease, the ones that we need to think about um, educating, identifying, uh, and being able to pick up people with psoriatic arthritis. And there's a lot we don't know about why people get psoriatic arthritis, so I don't have a magic predictive te test for it. There's a lot of clever people who are working on stuff to help us diagnose that. It does seem to be more likely, particularly in those who have nail psoriasis. Um, there's also some suggestion that it's higher risk in those who have scalp lesions or intergluteal cleft lesions, so bottom crack. Um, and then there are environmental risk factors that seem to be linked as well. So we often see um, that it seems to be triggered around the time of stressful events. So that can be medical stressful events, people being unwell and needing antibiotics. It can be life stress events. Um, and moving house was identified in one of the studies, um, which if I'm sure everybody's done it at least once, it's plenty stressful enough to make, uh, to make you come up with a new diagnosis. But there is definitely a significant hereditary risk. So it does run in families. Um, and we know that there are some genes that are associated just with the skin disease. And there seem to be some genes which are associated just with the joint disease. And this is a really cool study from Iceland. So if you're Icelandic, uh, you are on this nationwide database. You can log in and see you and you can trace your family back. It's like you know, crazy family tree for the whole of Iceland. Um, so they did a study looking at patients who had psoriatic arthritis from their hospital records and then matched them up. And if you have a relative with psoriatic arthritis, if you're a first degree relative, so son or daughter, parent, uh, then your relative risk of getting psoriatic arthritis is 39 times. So that's whackingly high. Uh, if it's a second degree relative, so if your granny has psoriatic arthritis, if your aunt has psoriatic arthritis, 12 times more likely. And they went down to third degree and even fourth degree before they didn't get a significant association. Um, so having it in the family is definitely uh, an increased risk. And it can be very variable. So we see patients that never really look the same. And I think that's just as true of psoriasis, really, and how it presents. Um, we see patients with very severe disease. Um, we see patients with small joint disease, um, that lady with the um, toes at the top, and very severe nail disease. We see patients with oligoarthritis, so the knees on the bottom. That lady only has one swollen knee. The rest of us fine. Um, we see a lot of patients with involvement in the distal joints, so the joints right near your nails at the end of your fingers, um, but basically it can look a bit like anything um, in terms of arthritis. So when we're looking at the joints as rheumatologists, we look at every joint. So we go from jaw joint um, down to the toes uh, to look for arthritis. We see something called dactylitis. Sorry, this should come with a pre-lunch warning. At least it's pre-lunch, not post-lunch. Um, so dactylitis is sausage toes. 
It's the fancy Greek word for sausage toes. Um, you can also get sausage fingers, uh, and that's where you get a swelling of the whole toe. So it swells up a bit like a chipolata sausage. Um, and you can measure it with this um, funky little circumferometer uh, if you're doing studies and you want to measure how things are responding to treatment. We also see a relatively high proportion of patients who have spinal involvement. And that's really important for us to pick up because the treatments are quite different and often because people don't raise it. So a lot of patients will come to clinic if you've got a swollen wrist or a swollen knee, but if you've got back pain, you say, oh, my back's a bit achy, but you know, I did a bit of gardening at the weekend or you know, whatever the excuse is. So back pain is very normal and you can't see that it's an inflammatory back pain related to your psoriatic arthritis. So it's trying to pick that up earlier, which is an issue. And we see enthesitis. So enthesitis is inflammation where tendons attach onto bone. Um, the most common site, as you can see here from these two pictures, is your Achilles tendon, because that's your biggest tendon that does a lot of work day to day. Um, it also can affect the plantar fascia, so um, underneath the foot. Uh, it can affect the elbows, so tennis elbow and golfer's elbow, which anybody can get, but people with psoriatic arthritis are more likely to get. So when we think about psoriatic arthritis, or at least when I think about psoriatic arthritis, I think about six different domains of disease. Um, and we look at each individual person and try and work out which bit is a problem for them. Um, so the vast majority of our patients do have some arthritis, not all of them, but the vast majority do. The vast majority as well have skin psoriasis, mostly because they get the psoriasis first. Although typically we see much milder psoriasis than dermatology do most people have mild psoriasis um, so although you're probably more likely to get arthritis with severe skin disease there's an awful lot of people out there with mild psoriasis so we see a lot of mild psoriasis with arthritis uh, we look for enthesitis so the tendon involvement we look for the sausage toes or fingers uh, we look for the spinal involvement so um, that's an mri scan of somebody's back and the the bright white bits are where it's inflamed and we look for nail disease so there are six different domains that we're treating and what we really want to do is pick it up early so I think this is true of pretty much every medical condition, the earlier you get it, the easier it is to treat. And that's particularly important for us because our, a proportion of our patients will get joint damage. So if we can intervene early and control the inflammation, we can reduce the chance of that joint damage. So this was a study from Ireland. They looked at patients coming through their psoriatic arthritis clinic. They looked back in the notes and talked to them about how long they had symptoms before they got diagnosed. And if patients had a delay in diagnosis of at least six months, um, which is quite common, so that's um, the, the average delay is about six months in the UK between symptom onset and getting a diagnosis. So if it's the average, that means half of the people must be waiting more than six months, the other half less. So those half that are waiting more than six months have a much higher rate of having erosive disease, so having damage on their x-rays. They have a higher rate of Mutilans disease, which is a much more destructive x-ray damage. They have a higher rate of disability. They have a higher rate of deformed joints, higher rate of spinal involvement, and a lower rate. So you can see they're just 40% or odds ratio of 0.4 uh, achieving drug free remission. So one of the big things that we're trying to do is work better for patients with dermatology, with GP uh, and with patient awareness to try and get patients to present with their arthritis uh, so that we can pick them up a bit earlier. Uh, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I was really lucky to come to the Psoriasis Association Psoriasis PSP final meeting. We were in the process of trying to work out if we could do a James Lynn priority setting partnership specifically for PSA, and this was the first one done in rheumatology, so none of our other arthritis had had a PSP, um, but I discovered the psoriasis one was happening, reached out to um, Helen from Manchester, who was leading it. She very kindly invited me to that last workshop and shared an awful lot of paperwork with me, which made my job a lot easier. 
Uh, and so we set up um, the PSA, James Lynn Priority Setting Partnership, um, shortly before COVID back in 2019. Um, and that was uh, in uh, collaboration with Louise, who's a research assistant who works with me. And very much like the psoriasis one, which I'm sure you've heard about before, what we wanted to know is what matters to people who are living with psoriatic arthritis. What should we be researching? How do we guide the field forward? What do people actually want to know? So what we wanted to discover is what researchers needed to be answered and clinicians needed to be answered and what patients wanted answering. And we followed the very um, organized and set out process that's um, set out by James Lind at the NIHR James Lind Alliance, uh, very much similar to the psoriasis PSP. So stage one is that initial survey. So that's the what do you want to know survey? Um, tell us your questions. Um, stage two is more about um, prioritizing those. And then stage three is that final workshop to get to a top 10. And I've already seen your psoriasis top 10 banner out there. Um, so in stage one, we had just over 300 respondent, respondents and just short of a thousand questions submitted. We ummed and ahed about exactly when to launch this. So we were going to launch this around the start of COVID in 2020. And we were slightly concerned that if we launched the survey, everyone would just ask COVID questions because it was very much a topical issue. Um, so we delayed it a little bit and then we sent it out to a few people to kind of pilot it. Um, and actually we hadn't given patients um, as much credit as we should have done because they all asked very sensible P PSA questions. But, uh, there, was, there was the odd COVID question, but it was certainly mostly PSA questions. So then we went forward with that first survey. And these are an example of some of the questions that we got through um, from clinicians and patients um, who sent forward their, their questions in the first version. And these are as they came in. Um, so a lot around diagnosis. Um, so is there a test? Um, how do we, why does it take so long to get a diagnosis? Um, a lot about symptoms. Why do we get fatigued? Um, a lot about treatment. How do we make things better? Uh, how do we measure flare ups? Uh, how do we get personalized medicine for people with psoriatic arthritis? So a whole mix of stuff as you'd expect. Um, and that survey was mostly people with psoriasis responding. Um, we had about a quarter of patients who were healthcare professionals. We had some family members of people with psoriasis, but the vast majority were people who had a personal history of psoriasis. Um, and then on the medic side, the vast majority were rheumatologists, which I guess you'd expect in terms of a PSA survey. Um, we had quite a high number of allied health professionals who we work with. So physiotherapists, occupational therapists, podiatrists, um, people who part of our multidisciplinary team. Um, we had some GPs, we had some dermatologists. Um, so a little bit of a mixture across the board. And then, as you may know, if you've been through this very similar talk, I'm guessing for the psoriasis one already, the next step is to think about um, what do we already know? So we've asked for all these questions, but actually have some of them already been answered? Are we trying to research something that we already know the answer to? So we went through an evidence check and we looked in the literature. We looked in lots of published journals to try and work out if these questions had been answered. And some of the questions fell into different categories. So we got a lot of service design questions. So when you put out unmet needs, there are some things that are research. Like can we develop a test to, develop, to get PSA? And there are some like, why don't GPs know enough about psoriatic arthritis? It's not a research question, really. It's more about service design. Why does it take my GP so long to refer me? Why did I have to wait six months before I got seen in the clinic? Um, things like that, that are about our design of our systems, um, which is changing, as you've heard already this morning. Um, but that's something we wanted to capture. Uh, and we are planning to publish that separately to think about kind of where the unmet needs or the concerns are from patients. But it didn't really fit into the research bit. We were looking for some unrecognized knowns, so questions people had asked, 
that we already knew the answer to. Something somebody had published already, a kind of easy win, um, which isn't a research need then, but it's an educational need. We need to be explaining it better to doctors or allied health professionals or patients so that they know that there is an answer to that question. That was a very short list. <laughs> um, and it's a short list because quite, quite a lot of our questions are broad. So if we have a question like what causes psoriatic arthritis, we know there are some things that cause psoriatic arthritis, but we don't know everything about it. So there's still plenty more to be answered. And then there were our true uncertainties. So that's what we really wanted. That was our kind of gold dust that we wanted to put together uh, into the next stage. So we looked in Medline, we looked in Cochrane, and we looked in NHS evidence. So three big databases that um, collect together all of the publications in the scientific literature. And we looked at guidelines and we looked at reviews and we looked for data over the last three years. Because as you can imagine, if you look for research on everything to do with psoriatic arthritis over an extended period of time, we would still be doing the evidence check now. Um, and we found about 126 um, publications, articles out there that were relevant, uh, and the steering committee reviewed all of those. Some of them had partial answers to some of those questions, and actually some of them gave us more questions. So if you look at guidelines for how to treat psoriatic arthritis, a lot of them include a research agenda, a list of questions that they couldn't answer when they wrote the guidelines. We, we don't know what to tell people about this because there isn't enough research. And so we scooped them in as well so that we had as many questions as we could. And we came up with a bunch of themes. Um, so these are the th themes that we identified moving through. So a lot of questions about treatment, some that were very specific to gender. Um, so fertility, menopause, um, hormones, a lot about causes of the disease, um, about a few about COVID-19. You couldn't avoid COVID-19, you still can't. Um, there are a lot of questions about the kind of burden of psoriatic arthritis, so the psychological burden, the financial, the social burden, a bit more beyond just the medical model outside of that. A lot of questions about diagnosis, about flares, that's a really common issue that our patients raise, and about effects of the disease and the treatment. So we had these eight different um, topics, and I'm not going to go through all of them because we'd be here all day, but I'm going to give you an example question from each of these coming through. Um, so about um, causes uh, and outcome. Uh, so does treating it early give you a better outcome, for example? Um, what key social factors are linked to outcomes in psoriatic arthritis? Um, is a person with psoriatic arthritis predisposed to get other conditions? Do we need to worry about additional comorbidities? Obviously a COVID question. <laughs> Does it impact on COVID risk, COVID treatments? Um, which psychological interventions support people with psoriatic arthritis? So not just medicines, but, but other treatment. Can we develop a test to pick up PSA? Um, what triggers an acute flare up? Uh, and finally, which factors affect uh, whether PSA will progress? So can we predict how bad somebody's going to get um, or whether it will go into remission? So can we kind of pick out the worst patients right at the beginning, concentrate on them? So then we went forward to stage two. So that's the priority setting ranking survey. Uh, and we had nearly 400 respondents and we gave them 46 questions. So we'd started with 1,000. We got rid of some because it didn't quite fit what we were looking for. And then we kind of mishmashed them into 46 example questions, because a lot of the questions are similar. They're asking the same sort of thing. So we tried to group them together and make an indicative question that kind of covered everything that different people had said about that particular thing. And we sent those questions out in a random order and got people to rank them. And again, most of the people had psoriatic arthritis. So about three quarters were people who were living with PSA, um, a fair proportion were healthcare professionals, and a few who were kind of friends or family members of people with psoriatic arthritis. And again, on the professional side, it's mostly rheumatologists, a bunch of allied health professionals like physios and OT and podiatry, and then a few GPs and dermatologists and others. 
And then that got us through to our final workshop. And I'd been to the psoriasis workshop, a lovely event down at um, the uh, British Association of Dermatology, um, kind of rooms uh, down in London. Um, so I was looking forward to a nice day out, a slap up meal um, and a lovely workshop. But of course, it's COVID. Um, so what we had was a Zoom meeting <laughs> all day in different workshop groups. Um, we had 23 participants, half of whom were people with PSA uh, or family members of people with PSA, and the other half were healthcare professionals. Um, and they weren't the same people that were on the steering committee. So we got a lot of normal rheumatologists and healthcare professionals who treat people but aren't researchers. They're not experts in PSA. They're not the people who spend all of their time researching this. They're, they're normal jobbing people who are in the hospitals seeing the patients who go, actually, I'd really like to know that. That would really help me treat people better in clinic. And we had to boil it down to the final 18 questions. And we kept arguing because we wanted 20. Firstly, because it sounds like a nicer number, doesn't it? It's nice and round. Um, and secondly, because there were a couple of extra questions that we thought were quite important that we wanted to boot in at the end. But only 18 fit on a Zoom screen in an Excel spreadsheet. So the rules from James Lind are you can have 18 final questions uh, if you do it by Zoom. So we stuck with the 18 because we did as we were told. Um, and what we did manage to do is send out biscuits. So this was the only positive to having a Zoom meeting uh, is we sent out a little pack to everybody who took part in that workshop. Um, and because I was picking, we had Stroop waffles um, and we sent them some tea and some biscuits uh, and a little welcome pack to get them through the um, all day workshop. But we got to our top 10. Um, so we got to our top 18, in fact, because that's how many fits on the Excel spreadsheet. But then you do need a nice round number to kind of sell at the end. So you get a top 10 and then you get the extra eight that kind of fall uh, just underneath. So the first one, and this was universally voted by every single kind of breakout group in that Zoom call um, as the top question. What's the best strategy for treating PSA? And you can see it's a bit of a cheating question because it's so broad, you can learn an awful lot within that question. You could, you could design 10 different studies. I could design 10 different studies if you've got any money this afternoon to answer this question. Um, so it's a nice broad question, but it's obviously what we care about most day to day. Um, from the patient perspective, they want to know how we can get people best uh, and from the doctor perspective as well. Uh, our second question was that one about prognosis. Can we predict who's going to do well, who's going to do worse, so that we can try and kind of individualise care? Can we predict who's going to get PSA? So that's that, not even just diagnosis, but actually even before that, can we kind of spot people who we think would get arthritis in the future? Um, is a person at higher risk of getting other medical conditions? So that's comorbidities. And we know from the research already that to some extent that's true. Um, does treating it early result in a better outcome? Does it reduce the severity of disease? Does it make it easier to treat? Does it give you a better outcome? Again, we kind of believe that's true from logic and from some studies, um, but there's probably more to be done on that question. What triggers a flare up? So I don't know how many um, in the room and online have psoriatic arthritis, but this is something that obviously plagues people all the time. You know, we typically see people every six months or every five years with PIFU coming. Um, but in between that, everybody's living with arthritis that does this to some extent particularly if we haven't got it very, under very good control. And even the people who were under good control do that and then suddenly have a bad patch. So flares are really important um, to know how to predict, how to manage uh, and how to measure in a lot of the research that we do. What's the best way to measure outcomes of treatment? And this kind of covers both research. So how do we test the new drugs that we've got coming out so that we learn the most about them? And also, what do we do in clinic? So if we see you in clinic, we can say, how are you doing? And you say, fine, because every patient in the world says, fine. You can have limped into the room. You'll still say, fine. And I'll go, you're not fine. Um, so we need something to measure that better. We need questionnaires. We need scans. We need examination um, to try and put that together and get an idea of disease activity and disease impact. 
Uh, the best, uh, sorry, long-term risks and benefits of medications. So this is one that came through really strongly, particularly from the patient point of view. Um, and, and clinicians clearly worry about this as well, but probably to a slightly lesser extent because we're not taking them. Um, so lots of studies are quite short term. So we know a lot about the short term risks of drugs, but actually if you're on a drug for 20 years or 30 years, what's gonna happen? Why do treatments stop working? So, and this is, an, this is a massive issue, issue for me, and unfortunately a massive issue for quite a lot of my patients. We find a drug that works, people do well, they're really happy, they get back to normal, and then that drug stops working. And that's really, really depressing. You've kind of have the rug pull, pulled out from under your feet, you felt better and you've got back to work and life and hobbies and whatever, and then all of a sudden your disease comes back. Uh, and how do we then treat them um, if you've failed a medication already? And then finally, what treatments uh, present the best benefit for people with psoriatic arthritis for those different tissue areas? So it's not just that we can say that there's one drug that's best. I can't tell you there's one drug that you should definitely have for psoriatic arthritis. Some work for spines, some don't, some are better for skin than others. Some have got better data in enthesitis or different studies with imaging that tell us more. So there's a lot more we can learn about comparing the drugs. We're in a really lucky situation, mostly following on from dermatology. Actually, most of the drugs in dermatology come to us like secondhand, they get passed down with a younger sister. Um, we get the secondhand stuff um, and we have a, a load of different drugs that work really, really well, but we still don't have many studies that tell us which is best, that compare two different drugs or three different drugs or using a combination of drugs or switching from one to another. And they're the things that we do every day in the clinic, but we don't have much research to back it up. So that is our top 10 uh, for psoriatic arthritis um, and this is the picture from our final steering group meeting so we managed one face-to-face -face meeting and that was right at the beginning of the PSP when we were planning it but everything else was done online um, so you can see um, Louise who's down here in the corner who led it uh, this is Susanna who was our JLA advisor um, you may well recognize uh, some other faces up there and um, some people uh, who were involved um, are in the room as well. So what's next? It's all very well creating a top 10. It looks very nice on a banner like yours out there, but unless you do something with it, it's not much use. So we want to disseminate the service design questions. We want to input that into some of the um, changes that are happening in how we practice. In rheumatology, we've got very similar problems to the ones you've heard in dermatology already this morning. We are grappling with massive backlogs, with long waiting lists, we're short staffed in pretty much every department. Um, we're looking at PIFU and how to manage that, um, whether it will involve us seeing patients too often or not enough, and how we pick up the people who don't come at the right time. So there's a lot to be done and hopefully we can pull that in together. Um, we found some unrecognized knowns, but they were mostly partial answers to questions, but there's certainly stuff that we can share more in education. And then we've got our true uncertainties that we want to take forward in future research. And the Psoriasis Association did something incredibly clever following on from the PSP, and that was to look at linking the PSP to their um, research funding. So I know because I applied, although you didn't give me the money, um, that you now have a question as, when you apply for a grant that says, how does this relate to the top 10? Um, how's it going to address one of those top 10 questions? So if we've discovered what everybody wants to know, let's make people answer it. It's amazing how you can persuade researchers to do things if they think there's money in it to do a study. Um, and that also works at a more general level as well. So the National Institute for Health Research, who fund a very large quantity of the clinical research that we do in the UK across all specialties, now have an open rolling call um, that links to James Lynn priority um, questions. So every three months when they have their standard deadlines, 
for a bunch of different types of grants, some that are a bit more sciencey um, and kind of about lab tests, some that are a bit more about trials, some that are a bit more about health service design. In each of those different categories, you can apply specifically to a James Lind question call. So that helps them prioritize that, um, that they know without even asking anybody, because they're not rheumatologists or dermatologists for the most part, but they know immediately that you're answering a question you should be answering. A bunch of people decided that was an important question. Um, we're hoping more charities follow suit um, on the rheumatology side as well as on the dermatology side and start kind of trying to link this to the top 10 uh, as well as other funding bodies. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Um, I will just put up our acknowledgement slide. So there's no point doing a survey if you can't get it out to the people you need to get it out to. We had an amazing selection of partners who worked with it, with us. So Britpact is the um, UK Alliance for Researchers and Patients Interested in Research in PSA. Uh, we led the process alongside James Lind, but then all of these other guys uh, were key partners who helped us to disseminate the survey collect information and recruit people um, for those that final online workshop with the biscuits um, and of all of those I think Sarai Association and PAPA were the two that were the big leading charities that supported the project so thank you very much